Hey everyone, and welcome back to this class, Unsupervised Machine Learning, Hidden Markov Models in Python. In this lecture, we are going to go over the very important scan function in TensorFlow. We just did this in Theano, but we're going to do it again from scratch in TensorFlow too, just in case you're not comfortable with Theano and you're more comfortable with TensorFlow. So why is this important? Think about how TensorFlow works. You have to create variables and link them together functionally, but they don't have values until you actually run the functions. So when you create your X matrix, you don't give it a shape. You just say, here is a placeholder I'm going to call X, and this is a possible shape for it. But remember that the shape argument is optional. Therefore, for all intents and purposes, we can assume that we do not know the shape of X. What happens if you want to loop through all the elements of X? Well, you can't. In order to write a for loop, you have to specify how many times that loop will run. But in order to know how many times the loop will run, we must know the number of elements in X, which we do not. Generally speaking, we cannot usually guarantee the length of our training sequences. So what happens if you want to do something like for i in range x dot shape 0? Well, you can't do this since x doesn't have a value yet. x dot shape 0 also does not have a value yet. Remember, x is just a placeholder. It only has a value when we call session dot run later and pass in x with the feed dict. This is where the TensorFlow scan function comes into play. The scan function allows you to loop through a TensorFlow array without knowing its size. This is similar to how everything else in TensorFlow and Theano works. Using scan, we can tell TensorFlow how to run the for loop without actually running it. There is another reason why the scan function is important other than the fact that we don't know beforehand how many times the loop will go. Remember that TensorFlow does automatic differentiation. It keeps track of how all the variables in your graph link together so that it can automatically calculate the gradient for you when you do gradient descent. The scan function keeps track of this when it performs the loop. Let's now look at the anatomy of the scan function. This is the scan function in its simplest form. The first argument is some function that it's going to apply to every element of the sequence that you pass in. The second argument is the actual sequence to pass in. So every individual element in this sequence will have some function applied to it. If this all sounds too abstract for you, don't worry because we are going to see some examples very soon. The way that we define the function that goes into the fn argument is very specific. In a way, it's much more strict than Theano. In particular, it must always take in two arguments. The first argument is the last output of this function. The second argument is the current element of the sequence. The TensorFlow scan function returns the outputs concatenated together. So for example, if I pass in 1, 2, 3 and my function is square, then the outputs will be 1, 4, 9. Now of course the output that tf.scan returns is still a TensorFlow graph node, so to get an actual value out of it, you need to run it inside a session. Let's now look at the full code to implement a squaring function. The relevant file in the course repo is HMM class slash tf underscore scan one dot pi if you want to look at it on GitHub. We start by importing numpy and TensorFlow, of course, and then we create a placeholder for x. Notice how it's going to be a one-dimensional array. That means each element of the sequence is a scalar. Next, we define our square function. Notice how to square the current value, we don't need to use the last value. However, because the function argument to scan requires us to conform to a specific interface, we need to define the square function this way, taking in both the last output and current element of the input sequence. Examples where we do need to use the last value will be more complicated, and we'll look at those later. <laughs> 
Next, we call scan. This takes in as input the recurrence function, which is square, and the sequence, which is the placeholder x. The output is a TensorFlow graph node that represents the output of the scan. We'll name this square op. Finally, we need to actually call the square op in a session and pass in the value for x as we discussed earlier. Let's run this and see what we get. Of course, the scan function can do more complex things than this. So let's incorporate another argument, initializer, which allows us to compute recurrence relations. First, just think about why we might need this. Well, we can see that the recurrence function takes in two things, the last output from itself and the current element in the sequence that we're scanning over. But what is the last output the first time this runs? Well, it's kind of undefined. How can the last output of a function we've never run before have any value? So this is why the initializer argument is important. The initializer argument represents the initial value of the output, which we did not make use of in the square example, because squaring only requires looking at the current element. One thing to keep in mind when you use initializer is that it's very strict. In particular, it must be the exact same type as the output of recurrence. For example, if you need to return multiple things from recurrence, it's going to be returned as a tuple. That means the argument to initializer can't be a list, it must be a tuple, even though Python coders typically use the two interchangeably. This also means that a tuple containing 5.5 is not the same as a tuple containing 5.0, 5.0. As before, you as a Python coder might think of these as equivalent, but TensorFlow Scan does not. As an exercise, we are going to use our new knowledge of TensorFlow Scan to implement the Fibonacci sequence. Take a minute to try this yourself before moving on to the next slide. If you don't remember how Fibonacci works, it's a simple recurrence relation. The current value is just the sum of the previous two values and the first two initial values are just 0 and 1. Okay, so now we're going to look at some TensorFlow code that implements Fibonacci. The relevant file in the course repo is hmmclass slash tfscan2.py if you want to look at it on GitHub. So the first thing we do is we create a placeholder called n. This is going to represent the number of Fibonacci numbers that we want. Remember that this has to be an integer. And if you don't know how to create a scalar placeholder, now you know. It's just a tuple with no values. In the recurrence function, we need to return two things. Why is this? Well, because in the Fibonacci series, we need two pieces of information, the last value and the second last value. Notice how everything here is consistent. If the thing returned by the recurrence is a tuple of size two, then we can index it using zero and one. Therefore, we can index last output by zero and one, where the element at index zero represents the last last value, and the element at index one represents the last value. Notice how in this example, we don't use the current input at all. In fact, we're not even quite sure what it is yet. Next, we have the scan function. Clearly, fn should be the recurrence function we just defined. The sequence we want to loop through is range of n. This makes sense because if we loop through range of n, that means we did something n times, which is exactly what we want to do in order to get n Fibonacci numbers. This also explains why we never use the elements of the sequence directly. The tricky part is the initializer argument. We know it has to be a tuple. We also know it has to be consistent with what's being returned by the recurrence, which is easy to see since all we do is addition. The last thing we need to do, as you know, is run this in a session and pass in some value for n. So let's try this and see what we get. <laughs> 
Our third example is going to be a simple low-pass filter, also known as a moving average filter. The recurrence relation for a low-pass filter is given by this equation, s at time t equals the decay rate times s at time t minus 1, plus 1 minus the decay rate times x of t, where s of t is the output and x of t is the input. We can do this using only the knowledge we've learned so far. Our goal is to be able to retrieve the clean version of a noisy signal. To simulate this, we're going to create a sine wave and add some noise to it, and then try to recover the sine wave. So if you want to try to code this yourself first, please give it a try as it would be a great exercise. The relevant file in the course repo is hmmclass slash tfscan3.py if you want to look at it on GitHub. Okay, so in addition to importing NumPy and TensorFlow, we're going to import matplotlib to visualize the signal. The first step is to create the signal, which as we've stated, is going to be a sine wave plus some random noise. We plot it here so you can see what it looks like. Next, we set up placeholders for both the sequence and the decay rate, although it's not really needed for the decay rate. Next, we implement the recurrence function, which is exactly what we stated earlier in the slides. Finally, we define our low-pass filter to be the scan over this sequence using the recurrence we just defined. The initial value here is arbitrary. You could set it to zero. You could also set it to the initial value of the sequence. Finally, we call the low-pass filter in a session, passing in the sequence and the decay rate, and then plotting the result. Let's run this and see what we get. 